Hello there, everybody. I'm Pat, the bass player of Sabaton. Hi, I'm Eka, the cello player of Apocalyptica. We're in Paris tonight, and you're watching Heavy One. When it comes to my childhood, I think I have a quite good, simple childhood growing up with um, in a smaller town where I think heavy metal was, we were a community, tight community. I really early wanted to play and um, did everything to be seen anywhere and uh, to play with the right guys and stuff. It was, um, I guess it was pretty uh, difficult because I was considered not so cool guy and everybody only played black metal because that was the only cool stuff yeah. and I wanted to play melodic metal and uh, when I said I wanted to start melodic metal band guy, the guys who run the, the small venues and stuff they were like uh, if you're gonna play this melodic power metal and stuff you're not gonna play here so we, we had nowhere to play with my band and uh, we had to play in the school aula and stuff like that because there was nobody who wanted to have us in the basically the only venue we had because we were uncool yeah and then uh, I guess after after a while everything changes into that but um, I was um, the, the first years uh, there was only black metal basically yeah. in Sweden and uh, I guess it influenced us a bit we were yeah, the first edition of Sabaton was playing black metal as well because we didn't have a proper singer and there was no, <laughs> no other thing to do then Joachim joined the band and we were influenced by Dimmu Borgia and we were like we need a keyboard player yeah. and he could write songs so he was the first one who could write some songs that were not shit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then he started to sing and was like well you actually sing melodical that's cool even if it's rough yeah. and I wanted to keep him as a singer so that's kind of uh, how the band started like that. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I grew up uh, in the suburb in close to Helsinki, and I'm actually second oldest of uh, five kids. So I started to play cello when I was nine years old, and I started because my two of my sisters played. Other one piano, other one violin. I just wanted to play something, and uh, I think cello was an accident choice for me. <laughs> it was just like a random, like you know. Put on the papers, maybe cello or trumpet or something, and I got in with cello. So, so I studied this classical stuff, and uh, I think uh, studying Apocalyptica was just because I was always a big metal head. I also was uh, in the school, I was in the music class, and I played drums, and I had drums home, so I started to play drums as, on, at the age of nine as well, but uh, never had a proper band because we didn't have enough good players in the suburb. You know, one really good guitar player, one piano player, but you know, didn't really <laughs> create a metal band. So I didn't even, never had that. So we just started to play metal with cellos because with my friends, uh, we all were cellists, and and that's how we started. So it was, but I think on on your story as well, you know, all the best things they always come up when you need to fight against the mainstream yeah. a bit. For sure. And you know, if someone could say the Sabaton sounds more like mainstreamish now, it, but you know, when you start, the attitude is like, no, we don't want to do this, you know, everybody's doing this, we do want to do different, and that's actually how the identity starts to grow. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's super important that you, you try your own style in that, and uh, uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny with you, uh, because you are, there is nothing like you. Yeah. That's the cool thing. Yeah. Uh, that's and there was nothing like you before you. Yeah. Which is like, I mean, Sabaton. At least there were bands like us before us. Yeah. But you are. But also first we. But and also the only we. One but also we had of the first album, uh, the world was full of people who who knew better than us what we should do and what we should play. So it's it's a little bit different. We, even we are unique, but it was like, but you should play. The second album or third album, actually, we had a big fight with the record company because they wanted us to make a, another cover album, you know, playing ACDC, Motorhead, whatever, using more effects and stuff. And we were like, no, we don't want to go there because we want to actually do our own music and figure out what we are as a band. Because in the beginning, we were just a bunch of friends who played cello and who loved metal, and we, we never even thought about forming a band. I had other bands, you know, classical chamber music groups like string quartets, piano quintets, piano trios, all that stuff. So those were kind of my bands and this was just one of those. 
okay. in the beginning. And then after two albums, we started to think, actually, it would be interesting to get more out of this instrumental concept. But the best way is that we write the music for ourselves. And then we got into big fight because everybody wanted to tell us, you know, this is how you get successful. Ah. Fuck that, you know. <laughs> we want to enjoy what we do. And, and that's why we are still here. Yeah. You know, that's actually yeah. the reason, going your own path. Yeah. I, I think that's the cool thing that you didn't copy anybody and you didn't do what people, people to told you. you. Yeah. And uh, today there is only you. Yeah. There are many bands who sound like Sabaton. Yeah. And uh, we sound like a lot of other bands. But you are, you have your absolutely own identity. Yeah. That's you cool. always had. That's so cool. But if you would, for example, only played covers, I think that your career would have been over 20 years ago. Yes, exactly. That, that's you would why have done the two albums and then people <coughs> would be tired of it because exactly. there would be no, nothing, nothing new. new. Yeah. So you did the right thing there. And uh, yeah, that's why you are still here. Yeah, exactly. Because you're innovative. And we've been enjoying what we do all the time, you know. I'm, I'm, that, well, that was what was. But there were a lot of times that we had to fight a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we had to fight a lot. The first albums <coughs> I ever bought um, would have been, um, yeah, there was something. I got a couple of records my sister didn't like. I mean, she is my older sister and she forced me to listen to some music. And um, there was, uh, she was uh, getting this like mail order uh, music. Yeah. So she got one CD per month. Okay. And which was the latest hits, and she always gave it to me after, after she listened <laughs> to the last. So I was always a little bit behind, like I was listening to last month's cool stuff. And then she gave me a couple of vinyls that she didn't play, um, and uh, they they were mostly the rock stuff that she buying because yeah. she bought any, anything that was popular. Yeah. And if there was a Guns N' Roses or a Metallica that she would buy, she didn't like the rock stuff so she would give it to me. I also got a lot of other stuff like whatever Dr. Alban and yeah. things like this that she gave that she didn't like. Eventually I uh, I had a very versatile record collection yeah. that was absolutely based on what used to be popular for a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. But then uh, her best friend and our neighbor came in one day and he said to me, hey, you, you have to stop teaching your brother to listen to shit. He has to have his own style. Yeah. He has to listen to heavy metal. And uh, then he showed me like all this Iron Maiden stuff that he had in like posters and stuff and records. And uh, we were sitting for all day listening to only Iron Maiden. And then the day after I bought my first, uh, my first own record that I bought, which, um, which was The Number of the Beast. Yeah. So this was the f on CD, this was the first record I bought. Before that I had a lot of other stuff yeah. from Random yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I had a lot of Michael Jackson, this, uh, this one, one artist I liked. Yeah. And, um, but the first I bought was this. Yeah. I, I, I didn't have money to buy music. But uh, I remember though I was maybe six or seven years old. I bought a C cassette. It was next to cheap, uh, next to free, you know. <laughs> and it had this uh, Southern flag. It was a rockabilly collection. <laughs> and in the suburb where I grew up, it was pretty rough area. And there were those cool-looking guys, you know, were having those flags. Not knowing uh, as, as on that day, no stories behind the flag, you know. And I bought that <laughs> when I was six or seven. Rockabilly collection. And beside that, I just was. Uh, my father had a huge collection of classical music. I didn't like classical music when I was young. Until I was 13, I bought my first classical record by myself. It was Sost Dimitri Shostakovich Symphony Number no. 7, Leningrad. And that, that was the first time I really got into classical music. And, and be before that, I bought some, I liked Duran Duran and Billy Idol. And, uh, but mainly I had to see cassette copies from my friends because I couldn't, I didn't have money to buy any kind of uh, CDs uh, or uh, cassettes or vinyls. So I was depending on what my friends had, but, uh, but then I, I heard, I think I bought my first metal record when I heard Master of Puppets first time in some classical orchestra camp. Some friends had that, uh, I was totally blown away by the song Orion, the instrumental thing. Mm -hmm. And that was like, okay, I need to get this album. And I think that was kind of my first really want to buy album. Maybe age of 13. 
but it's it's uh, on those times it was so different when we yeah. grew up that it was not so easy to get the stuff and especially it was very hard to get enough money to buy it the was. CDs and I, I was living like a half an hour bus drive from Helsinki I never went there by myself as a kid so there was no record store where I lived and uh, so it was it was all the time what you got I was passing by the city a lot around there and uh, I started hanging out in record stores and it was like this thing here yeah, going through everything yeah. that was returned and a lot of um, buying secondhand albums a lot of times but it was cool uh, from the buying from the covers and um, the most of the stuff were black metal at this time because this was what was selling yeah so and especially in Sweden the biggest bands they, they were all the time there the black metal stuff and I was buying a lot of it but I never like home listened to it and like no, it's yeah. not that good. Yeah. Give me Iron Maiden and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but Iron Maiden at this time was so small. They were tiny. They yeah. were almost yeah. nothing. They were uh, without Bruce and they were selling 2,000 tickets in Stockholm. Yeah. Tiny band at this time. So nobody <coughs> cared about it. And all the melodical stuff was basically meaning nothing. Yeah. So listening to, to Halloween and Blind Guardian at this time meant that you are alone. Yeah. <laughs> You have no friends. I was pretty alone because everybody was listening. I'm born in 75 and everybody was really into Twisted Sisters and Wasp and that kind of stuff. And I didn't really like that. So that's why I was listening to Duran Duran and Billy Idol. But then from metal, I, I went, got into trash metal. So mm -hmm. trash metal for me was like a punk of my, my generation. You know, when I was a teenager, all this uh, Sepultura, Pantera, Slayer, this, this okay. stuff was really much. That was always what I grew up, Anthrax. Okay, know. cool. I never got this kind of thing that, oh yeah, I want to be a musician. I played, I like to play, but I never thought that it will be my profession until I got into Sibelius Academy when I was 17 years old. Then I realized I might have skills to be a classical cello player. And even then I didn't think so much that what actual work I'm going to do. I just wanted to play, you know? and. Uh, suddenly realized that, okay, I can keep, get living out of it, you know, but it was quite late. I was, uh, I think there was not a record for me. It was the, the VHS video yeah. from a Skid Row road movie called Roadkill. Yeah. And uh, I think I watched this one so many times and this <coughs> was what got me excited. Like, that's the life I want. Yeah. I want to go around and see crazy stuff and, and do a lot of adventures and be on the stage and play for a lot of people. That's what I wanted. Yeah. So this one was actually the one that inspired me. I want to do it. Yeah. And then um, Skid Row was one of those bands that really was so strong for me in the beginning. Yeah. And uh, me and my best friend, he, he w was pushing me to learn and we were playing together. And uh, so he was on guitar, I was on bass and we had super high volume and we were playing along to the videos, to the VHS, and we had the amplifiers, and we play along, yeah. and we had the video screen on, and you know, pretending we were on tour with Skid Row and stuff. Yeah, for like that, that's that's cool. I I never had that kind of band dream because uh, even I like to play in the band in the school times, but you know, that's, I was just playing fucking cello and. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, you, you don't think about yourself being rock musician with cello, so I was just, on my teenage, I was just practicing, practicing, playing, studying, that stuff, and the whole this apocalyptic started as an accident. We started to have fun, we never thought about making an album, and then we played first time for Metal Crowd, which was really, really great experience in Helsinki, and we got offered a record deal based on that, and we made the first album, and we were thinking, okay, if we sell 1,000 copies and we get a few gigs, that's great. And that was kind of, even on that point, 96, we were thinking, okay, this is just a little side path <laughs> of, of the you know, bigger picture. And then it started to go on and go on and go on. And what is funny, when I was 20 years old, I was like thinking purely that I'm going to be a classical musician. And then suddenly I end up being a rock musician and more, I, I spent like almost 25 years being in a metal band, you know, <laughs> playing metal. And, and so it's, for me, it's very hard to say even that what was the change or, you know, what changed when. And it's been like 
going like this, hand in hand. We had the, <coughs> me and my friend, we, we, we were mainly focused on partying while yeah. we were practicing. So we wanted to be in a band, we wanted to party, so we were in an average rehearsal. We would drink <laughs> beers and watch the videos and party and, and play. I think I was partying more as a classical musician than as a rock musician. <laughs> we were partying crazy. The amount. People think that the classical world is dry. Maybe it's nowadays it's, it's dry, but not in Finland on those years. Oof. We were terrible. <laughs> there are no... There are always classical rock songs that I could listen to. Yeah. And uh, I think in, if you take any night in the tour bus and there is a little party there and you put on like classical rock, everybody is happy. But not just a specific album. Yeah. And for me, I have a lot of playlists. And uh, sure, there are some albums that I go back to. Yeah. And um, I think uh, the, there's always this all time favorite and it's. Sabotage Dead Winter Dead. Yeah. This is my the one I would go back to if there's only one album. I yeah. Would I also I, I have this uh, I have certain metal music. It, most likely it's it's something um, relatively modern like Gojira or a little bit older Pork Band Tree and that kind of stuff. What I like to listen when I'm running or doing stuff like that on on, on the tour. But then I have some weird albums in a certain mood. You know. On, during the tour I like to listen to and it's not metal at all it's like something from Massive Attack or or from Björk mm -hmm. old stuff from Björk like Homogenic or stuff like that uh, because that creates completely it brings me somewhere on my memories yeah. and cre creates yeah. uh, this kind of mind state of mind and uh, that I sometimes like to visit <laughs> on the touring life or Arvo Pärt, the classical composer. I have a few pieces from him that I always, if I want to really relax in the bed, in the bus, and just, you know, chill out and let my mind work on itself, I put this kind of stuff. All right. But, you know, it's, it's weird. It's a combination. Really hardcore metal, <laughs> like like Gojira, and then, or Mesuga, or something like that. And then, then in the other hand, something kind of pop, very atmospheric, electronic music. So, All right. I like the balance, I like the contrast. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> Do you collect I, records? I, I don't really collect, but my wife is still old school uh, record buyer. But she, she orders the CDs home, which is kind of completely stupid. But you know, I like it because I still like the sometimes at home. I don't listen at home, I don't listen to Spotify or stuff like that. I don't have any system to connect you know, my devices to the stereo. So when I ever put music on at home, I go and take a CD or a vinyl and uh, put it on, on, on the player. I, am, I have a vinyl player in my office, so there I would listen to vinyls yeah. uh, sometimes uh, when I want to have an uninterrupted listening exactly, session, because yeah. otherwise it's very easy to click something and just listen to it. And I get a lot of um, requests. I mean, for Sabaton uh, Open Air Festival, I have to go through a lot of bands yeah, to listen imagine, yeah. if they fit to the billing or something like that. So I, I, that I spend a lot of time on, on YouTube and, and things like that. But um, to collect some records, I collect from a few bands yeah. things that records that I somehow want to keep for for a reason that one day I have a story with it, like this. Uh, like the record I got from you from this tour. Yeah. Of course, this is like stays there, and it's yeah. uh, it, this goes uh, like okay, save. And there are some others uh, that I don't know. I connect it to a certain event or something. Yeah. Then I want the record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have some uh, uh, a lot of uh, younger bands. I buy their stuff. Yeah. Uh, especially if there is their debut album and I saw them maybe grow up or something I, a lot of Swedish younger bands and some of them I uh, consulted I helped them to to reach somewhere then I really go after and I buy the first record because yeah. I really think that it means something yeah if I was there inspiring to do them them yeah. to do it or or something like that then I really want to keep that I, 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 I have the same that I, I keep certain records that they have some background story around it or they've been meaningful for myself.
but you know, especially if there's some kind of connection to people who made it, or you know, uh, or it's been uh, important part of certain period of life. Yeah. That somehow you, it, it's kind of a memory. Yeah. And yeah. and Spotify can never replace that. No, no, no. No, no, no. The, the, that's not the music co comparing to the feeling that you take. You're going through your warehouse or something at home or closets and then you find the thing and you start to you know look at it and put it on the player and you know nothing can replace that no, feeling no. so that's why i'm also keeping certain things that have deeper meaning and those will remain for a very long time i think yeah and um that's something uh, if if one day retiring and stuff then all these mean something yeah exactly but uh, i i didn't I collected CDs and vinyls before of a yeah. lot of bands and stuff, and I collected and I bought a lot of stuff. But I don't do anything today. I don't buy anything that I don't feel yeah. something emotional about. Yeah. We've been yes. touring with a lot of bands that we <laughs> that we grew up listening to. Yes, uh, but I guess both of us. That's it's just a part of what happens. Yeah, uh, it's strange the first time it happens, but over time it just becomes. You just realize, as you are yourself a musician, you realize that other people are yeah. musicians too. Exactly. And uh, that you have so much in common, like, okay, maybe some people are a little bit older, maybe they've been doing it for a while, but they are no different. Yeah. So that's the thing. Yeah, yeah it's really, yeah. yeah it's, it's, people think that it's something weird, but then it's actually surprising how natural it is. Yeah. When you start to work together or something, then you just your colleagues yeah. and of course sometimes it feels like for us we released our first album uh, in May 96 and already in November in 96 we were opening two nights for Metallica and Helsinki and we met the guys first time it was maybe our fifth show after the album release <laughs> was opening for Metallica which was kind of completely okay. absurd yeah, yeah, you know yeah. but then when it happened it was like yeah this is actually pretty cool yeah, yeah this is how it should be yeah. and or or once I was uh, we did a song uh, with uh, Max Cavalera mm -hmm. and Matt Hook, a duet. And I had to fly to Munich, uh, Cavalera was on tour, so then I, we didn't have producers, so I was producing it. And suddenly I'm in a situation, I'm in, in the studio, Cavalera is in the singing booth and asking me what to do. I'm <laughs> like, this is kind of weird because I've been a massive fan of this guy. And then you just have to put it aside. Yeah, you know, yeah, it yeah. is, okay, now we, we work together. Yeah. So, That's, uh, you know, so it becomes kind of really natural to do those things. But and over the years, there's been many changes. Like, I mean, bands we supported have been supporting us. Yeah. So things change, and and uh, but it's just very normal, and everybody's yeah. cool with it in the industry. There has been a few who are egoistic, and they have the wrong mm -hmm. mentality. They are like, uh, and they they are fighting against and trying to be something that they are not but those are people we realize quite easy yeah and uh, those people they are not staying alone so yeah they're not usually people who get far they they are hard workers yeah and they know what it requires and how much what kind of attitude it requires to become successful and to build up a long-term career and that's why you know those people usually they stay pretty grounded yeah and and uh, it's, uh, unless they do too much of the drugs. Yeah, if they don't get into that path, but usually they don't stay successful very yeah. long after that. But I had one, one funny story about, you know, working with your idol. Like uh, we, we went to Metallica, invited us to play on their 30th anniversary party. And they wanted to play songs together with us. So we went into their headquarters and, and I, I suggested them to play one. And then I wanted that, that, that you know, actually we would do it the way that we will play until the double kick drum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that part, just just the cellos and chains. And we are in the rehearsals and then we were starting something like, okay, sorry, Lars, I have a thing for you. You know, can you be just the, not playing until then? And <laughs> Lars was like, what the fuck? I will go home then? <laughs> and I'm like having a joke out of that. But you know, it's, it's like, you can't go into that kind of situation that, okay, like a shy that, ah. okay, that's Metallica. Okay, what should we do? It's like, yeah. Okay, let's do something cool together. Yeah. And, you know, and there needs to be the attitude. And the, the less, uh, yeah, don't be uncomfortable. Exactly. Just be, Just be yourself. Yeah. That's the easiest way to live in general, I think. <laughs> <laughs> How would you like to work with? I mean, uh, I, I think it was. Um, uh, I mean, that, that was one of the reasons we worked together. <laughs> yes, because exactly. I, I really wanted to, inco uh, you know, do yeah. something with you because uh, it, it's something, <clears throat> it's not metal 
it's metal meets metal, but it's different. And it, it uh, involves two different approaches on the whole take yeah. of the genre. And uh, I mean, if we take another like classical metal band, it just mm. becomes another classical metal song. Yeah. With you, it could be, it's something different. Yeah. And uh, that's what I really wanted to do. We've done a couple of tracks together with some bands, but it doesn't really, I mean, just, okay, here's a singer, we, re we write a song, we replace the singer. It doesn't really give only that, you know. Yeah. Doing something more, that this is interesting. Yeah, something organic. So I, I don't know, I mean, uh, I, I don't think that, you know, Sabaton and uh, let's say Metallica. Yeah. If, if you put us together, it is, yeah. the outcome yeah. is not so cool, I think. Yeah, there are so many similar it's, things around. and it's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know if it will be good or yeah. what it will be out of. But if you would take Sabaton and combine it with, let's say, uh, yeah, a band like... Uh, I don't know, but like yeah, 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 yeah like Bjork, yes, yeah, exactly. Then you get something unique. Yeah, that some, some you take somebody who would whole take thing. brings has a completely different flavor than what you have in in your thing, and that's that's also for us. It's for me. It's because uh, we've done so much of collaborations. It's not about name dropping or a dream artist to work with. It because when when the the approach is right and actually those principles are right, it. Which, which project becomes the most rewarding and, you know, comes out the greatest. You can't plan that upfront in a way. And it's not about the name or, you know, who is who. It, it's really not about that. It's, it's how you approach it. What bring into exactly. it. Exactly. And we've done now, we are releasing the first vocal single now, I think next week. And, and we're going to release other vocal singles during the year, which are not in the album. So we, we are kind of working on the instrumental record and then different collaborations and we have always a different reason and different approach why we want to collaborate with someone and uh, I, I think that's interesting but it's not I don't, I don't have I, I get that question all the time because we have had so many guests yeah, yeah, yeah. that you know who would you like to work with and it's like yeah in a way the the list is endless Huge. and there's no list at yeah. the same time so it's it's kind of keep keep yourself open and and just because this this collaboration, for example, has been really really great for both of us. Really, really new kind of approach. Also for us to join you on stage and you know to record the song together, and rehearse and and uh, and the output is different what you do than what we do. But then combining that and I think the key thing and the best thing on doing collaborations in different ways is that how much you can learn from other people when you work together with them. And I, for me, that's the, yeah. the key essence of collaboration. And the whole idea of what, everything we did was also to have the, I mean, we are on tour together and the whole idea is that we should share our fans. Exactly. And uh, the more we did together, the easier for the fans to understand yeah. why we are here. And uh, that's why we did a lot I think of that, stuff. That, that was really what, what I really got impressed about when, when we were, met first time, when we were talking about uh, connecting the fans, I, I really love that idea and, and the feeling and when I was telling about this tour in the interviews I was always telling people that you know what we want to create together is like we show that we are all part of the event including everyone who comes into the hall is warmly invited to enjoy the whole thing yeah. and I, I really really like that, appreciate that approach. <laughs>